This is our final week in the discussion of God Speaks, the major prophets, and we're spending two weeks on each. And uh, this is our last week in the book of Daniel. And I was really uh, touched and encouraged and challenged by what I think is one of those key lessons that every single one of us need from the book of Daniel. To do that, let me introduce to you my granddaughter. This is Elaine. She was born with a plan to run the universe. (laughs) She is delightful and sweet and highly directive. She thinks anybody who comes within her sphere, she should help them figure out what they should do with their life. So, would you do this, and you sit over there, and you take care of this, and why don't you do that? And it's a wonderful trait, but her mom and dad started doing something with her when she was very young. So we were there visiting, and she said, Elaine, who's the boss? She says, Daddy's the boss, and Mommy's the boss. Right, she said, now Papa Paul and Nana are here. Who's the boss? Papa and Nana are the bosses. Who's not the boss? I'm not the boss. (laughs) Are you the boss of your little brother Bennett? No, I'm not the boss of Bennett. (laughs) Who are you the boss? I'm the boss of me. And you know what? I think sometimes God wants to have that exact same conversation with you and me. Because he has to review for us. Who's the boss? And we're going to talk about, I believe, an incredibly important spiritual attitude. And that is God desires a heart that is filled with humility. The quality of humility is not really that much esteemed in the world, but in the scriptures, Jesus is the champion of humility. And it's the attitude of humility that opens our hearts, that it opens God's grace to us. It opens growth. It opens possibilities. And there's nothing wrong with being confident. But there's a slight difference between confidence and arrogance. And you and I slide over to arrogance. Well, at least I slide over to arrogance very, very easily. And so I want to talk about the book of Daniel and what God teaches us about who he is and who we are and how that's supposed to work together so that we are a confident people but not an arrogant people. Let me review just a little bit. We've talked through the prophets and this theme we've brought out is that God keeps saying, here's the word of the Lord and we need to hear God's word daily. God also wants to be known, which is an amazing privilege. God says, I've done this so you will know that I am the Lord. And God invites us into a relationship with Him. And God deserves to be honored. And when we have a temptation to say, I'm the man, God says, well, I'm the God. Let's talk. Daniel was taken from his home in Jerusalem as a young man, a person from nobility, a person of education, a person of privilege, And he was forced marched 800 miles to Babylon where he was put into service and put into training. And he had an amazing ability to fit in and to flex and to connect with people who were very different than he was used to. But he also learned how to not compromise and to have convictions and to stand up for what he believes. Daniel, I believe, is a wonderful picture of confidence and humility without arrogance. He served two kings in the stories we're going to talk about this weekend. He served Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, who were arrogant, and God humbled them. So walk with me through this story as we we learn that humility is crucial. And I see this all the way through the scripture, and I actually read a very interesting book called Humilitas, which was talking about in the Greek and Roman world, If you could brag about your abilities, if you could talk about your accomplishments, it was all good as long as you could back it up. In other words, there's nothing wrong with bragging as long as that's true. And Jesus brought a completely different idea, that the greatest among you will be the servant of all, that there is this quality of humility that really was championed and changed the world 
because of Jesus. And in James chapter 4, he says, that's why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but he gives favor, grace to the humble. And, and I simply would ask you that question as we walk through the qualities of arrogance, the qualities of humility. I want you to do some genuine reflecting on your own heart. Do I have a tendency to press towards arrogance? Whether or not you're an upfront leader or a vocal and visible person, do you flex towards pride or do you learn how to live in humble confidence? Because they may look a little different, I mean, they look a little similar at the beginning, but they are totally different in the heart. So if you want God to be against you, then continue to cultivate your pride. <clears throat> I find one of the examples of Daniel's humility was that he prayed. Daniel, the scripture tells us, prayed three times a day. And in fact, when some of his enemies were going after him, they not only knew how many times a day he prayed, they knew how to catch him at prayer. Because that was a regular part of his life. And I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to pray light when things are good and pray heavy when things are bad. You know what that means? It means that we're like that fighter pilot who tried to land on this uh, aircraft carrier, and he was coming in, and he missed the first wire with his tail hook, and he missed the second wire, and he realizes that he's going to go off the end of the deck and into the drink, and so he hits the afterburners, and he pushes all the gas he could go, and it drops off the edge of the carrier, and it goes down to within about two foot of the waves, and finally kicks in and takes off. And over the radio, he comes on, and he says, thanks, God, I'll take it back now. But isn't that what we do? In the crisis, oh man, I'm all about prayer. I'm dependent on God. I know how weak I am, how needy I am. But when things kind of normalize, it's okay, God, I got it now. And I think that's an attitude of arrogance, isn't it? That we are unaware of how dependent we are. And in fact, it's not until things go wrong that we realize how we've been taking all of God's good gifts for granted. There's a, there's a convicting question in 1 Corinthians 7. He says, what do you have that you haven't been given? It's a really easy answer. We have nothing that we haven't been given by God or by others. And you say, well, I worked hard for this. Well, who gave you the strength? Who gave you the opportunities? Who gave you the, the wisdom? Who gave you life? And so arrogance leads us towards entitlement. Humility leads us towards gratefulness. And when Daniel's praying, he, he's revol involved in this dialogue with God all the time, three times a day. He knelt and he acknowledged the God of heaven. And so I am impressed by that he prayed. I'm also impressed by how he prayed. So Daniel, you remember, is the, the godly one. He is the, the good one. And for some reason, he gets the punishment that when the deportation comes, he is selected to go to Babylon. Have you ever suffered for somebody else's sins? I'm sure you have. Anytime somebody's gotten really angry with you, you've suffered for their sins. And it's easy for us to pray as though I'm the good one and they're the bad ones. And I told you that God humbled Isaiah to begin with. He showed him his own sin before he could talk about the sins of others. And I see that in Daniel's heart. Look at this prayer from chapter 9. It says, I prayed to the Lord my God and I confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. So praise and thanks and gratitude. And then he says, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. We! What was Daniel doing? Daniel is taking on himself, identifying with the sinfulness of his own people. And you know, I looked at that, and the first thing I thought is, that's not how I pray. They, Lord, they need your help. This nation is a mess. These people are a mess.
And it's true. <laughs> but isn't it difficult to get more personal? And I thought to myself, what if we prayed so that the sins of our church, we said, we confess, God, that we have ignored your commands. We've taken you for granted. We, we. Because you see, what is most off-putting about religious people is that they think they are good and everybody else is sinful. And when we are humble, we recognize that what we have most in common is that we struggle with sin. We have failed, God. What humility that shows. And, you know, I think God brings him to that place so that he can be a prophet. Because, listen, this is what struck me. Sin needs to be called out. That's part of what prophets did. But sinners need to be called in. And don't we have a tendency to do the opposite? To push sinners out and then to identify our goodness and what, what we've done that, that we're proud of. And I see in Daniel somebody who has this deep humility with confidence he is called to stand, not just before a group of people. He's called to stand with, really, the first world emperor. And he gets called in only in the crisis times. And then he has to decide, is he going to tell the truth and speak truth to power, or is he going to make it all nice and easy? It takes incredible confidence to do that. And Daniel did that. But he does it with humility. So, I believe that's the message that God is trying to help us see in this series of stories. So, the next story is about the story of Nebuchadnezzar. And we saw him last week, and Nebuchadnezzar was this first world emperor. His father had done a lot of the conquering, and now he was the ruler of an incredible, vast, and wealthy kingdom. And he spent a lot of his effort building the city of Babylon the city proper was 14 square miles. It had a 56-mile wall around it that was 300 foot high. He had incredible, the, the hanging gardens of Babylon, 75 foot high, incredible structure with plants and trees coming out of it. It was called one of the seven wonders of the world. You may have seen the beautiful Ishtar gates that had the blue brick tile with the winged lions that are still existing today. And he built an incredible kingdom. If you, if you were to look and you would say, wow, now that guy has accomplished something with his life. I have to tell you an honest story. I, several years ago, I don't even know who this is so I can tell the story, a guy came up after church and all I remember is that he was a very ordinary person, somebody that, you know, in a group of 100, you would have completely overlooked him, and, and he didn't have any skills, and in fact, his family was kind of a mess. That's about all I remember. And he came up after the service, and he said, Pastor, could you pray for me? And I said, sure. He said, what? I said, what are you struggling with? He said, I'm really struggling with pride. And you know what immediately came to my mind? About what? What are you struggling with pride? I don't see any huge accomplishments that you really should be filled with pride. And you know, that Holy Spirit whisper came in just a little later and said, what about you, Paul? What are you struggling with pride? And don't you think God says about what? About what? And Nebuchadnezzar, at least, he had, you know, a huge amount of accomplishments behind his name. And, and he lived in this great city. And then he had a dream. And God, amazingly, seems to keep reaching out to Nebuchadnezzar. And he has a dream that he knows is from God. Let me read you a little bit from chapter 4. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, turn to chapter 4. I'm going to read the first couple of verses. Or I start in verse 4, I mean. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. Doesn't that sound like a picture of arrogance and elegance? I had a dream that made me afraid as I was lying in bed. The images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners, 
That's, that's the group that Daniel was included with, the Magi. He said, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He's called Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. So he tells him this dream, that there's a big, huge tree that all the birds of the heaven lived in and all the animals of the field sheltered under, and he said he saw this tree and it was cut down. And the great fall of the tree came, but, but the stump was bound with bands of iron. And then it said seven times passed over it, and then the tree began to grow. And Daniel said, remember last week, the two key words, with wisdom and with tact? And so Daniel says, O king, I wish this interpretation were for your enemies, not for you. What a great tactful move just before you stab somebody with the truth. And he says to him, here's the interpretation, your majesty. This is the decree that the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. Notice he also always talks about the Most High God or the God of heaven. The the highest God, the, the real God. And he says, you will be driven away from people and will be lived with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth. And he gives to anyone as he wishes. You think you're a big deal, Nebuchadnezzar. But unless you are live in humility acknowledging that you are not the most high. You're high, but you are not the most high. And when you acknowledge that, then you are living in harmony with me. When you don't acknowledge that, then I'm going to be against you. And he must have taken the warning taken the warning to some what to heart because it was a whole year later. And it says he was walking around on the roof of his palace, and he looks around and he says, wow, look at this mighty city that I have built. And it said, in an instant, he lost his mind. Has that ever happened to you? Of all the things I've lost, it's my mind I miss the most. You say, you say that? But literally, his sanity was taken from him. You see, he was sitting atop this pinnacle of incredible accomplishment. And yet, one little twitch in his brain, and he was nothing. In fact, it says for seven years, he went out and he was living like an animal. His toenails grew like claws. It says his hair grew out like feathers. Can you imagine the smell? And for somehow, they still kept him in the pasture because he was the great Nebuchadnezzar. I don't know how his kingdom lasted for seven years. I don't know how they covered it up for a long time. And then, at the end of seven years, God restored him. Can I just say that when God's trying to make a point, he's fairly eloquent? And it says, I was restored. I, Nebuchadnezzar, now praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven, because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Now, when it happens to Nebuchadnezzar, or there's a few other people I could suggest, there's something in us that says, wow, that's great. Kanye West is a rapper who thinks he is everything on a stick. He is so arrogant. And he was invited to go to a fashion runway show that was fairly exclusive, and they said, you can go to our show as long as you will promise not to go to any of the others, because everywhere he goes, there's a huge focus. And so he went, he says, I, the next day I went to the studio with a group named Daft Punk, and he wrote a song called, I Am a God. Wes says, because it's like, yo, nobody can tell me where I can and can't go. Man, I am the number one living and breathing rock star. I am Axl Rose. I am Jim Morrison. I am Jimi Hendrix. I thought two or three of those are dead, so they've already been uh, seriously demoted. You can't say you love music and then say that Kanye West can't come to your show. 
To even think they would tell me where I could and couldn't go is ludicrous. It's blasphemous to rock and roll. Yeah, wow. He's got the disease bad, doesn't he? And Nebuchadnezzar says, oh yeah, God is able to reduce people. Why? Because he's angry at us? Because he's mean? No, because pride keeps you from spiritual life. Let me give you something for free. If you want to just take your sheet, the blank sheet that's next, or that's next to your notes, I want you to write confidence on one side, and I want you to write arrogance on the other. Because I was walking through this, and I feel like this is critically important, that when you're arrogant, it means you think you've arrived. It's when you're arrogant, you don't think you need help. When you're arrogant, you don't think you need correction. When you're confident, let me give you these contrasts. Confident people are grateful. Arrogant people are entitled. You see, gratitude says everything I have is a gift of God, and I am so appreciative. And don't you think that part of the difficulties and trials we go through in life are to remind us of how good it got, God gives us most of the time? You, you never know how wonderful health and normal is until you've been sick. You never know how wonderful it is if the doctor says you're fine until you've been through cancer. So we live in confidence with gratitude. Arrogance says, this is my normal. What else would I be? This is what I, and we don't say it out loud, but we think, what do I deserve? Confidence says, this is for God's glory. Daniel was about the kingdom. Daniel was about God's glory. Daniel was about lifting God up. Arrogance is about my glory. I wonder what people think of me. I wonder what kind of reputation I have. And let me just give you a little bit of a way to measure. The measure of your pride and your arrogance is how you respond when somebody corrects you. This last week, I got a messenger from somebody who in town that doesn't go to church and they don't particularly like me. And they wanted to tell me about how my driving should be improved. I did that too, yeah. And you know what? They were really right. But how did it make me feel? <laughs> Who has the right to tell me what to do, right? See, that's that arrogance that jumps up so fast. I mean, we'll admit we're not perfect, but when somebody tries to point out how we're not perfect, we get angry. Why? Because we're arrogant. Confident people are willing to serve others. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. Arrogant people want others to serve me. How do you treat waitresses? How do you treat the guy at the gas pump? How do you treat people who serve you? Like you deserve it and they should be really fast? That's arrogance. Confidence is when my personal convictions limit me. Daniel said, no, I can't eat that. I'm following God, so I am limiting myself because of God's role in my life. Arrogance says... I want more of everything. How much of stuff will make you happy? Just a little bit more. Just a little more. It's always more and more. And in confident people, their life is built on truth. Arrogant people, my life is built on my opinion. And isn't it amazing how quickly we want to give everybody else our opinion? Of the people you know, how many are good listeners and how many are good talkers? The ratio is not even. Let me ask you a deeper question. Are you grateful? Do you live for God's glory? Are you delighted in serving others? Do you let the conviction of the Spirit limit you? Do you take correction well? Is your life built on truth? You see, I think you and I probably have more in common with Nebuchadnezzar than we do with Daniel. The next story is actually a perfect book into this. Nebuchadnezzar dies and he hands off his kingdom to a guy named Belshazzar. This is a little, a little confusing because Daniel's Babylonian name is Belteshazzar with a T. 
The next king's name is Belshazzar. They're all related to the god of Babylon. And he takes over the kingdom. He is typical of a child raised with privilege. He's spoiled. And where his dad has accomplished a lot, he's just following on his father's coattails and living there. And he is incredibly arrogant. And there's a a picture in chapter 5 where Belshazzar is holding a big party. Now let me give you a little context. They're at war with the Medo-Persian Empire. The army of the Medes is outside the city, but they've got 56 miles of walls that are 300 foot high, and the towers are 150 feet higher than that. They think they're invincible. Look what he's doing on the night before. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. And while Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring to the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles and wives and concubines might drink from them. So they brought the golden goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them. And as they drank wine, they praised the gods of gold and of silver, of bronze and iron and wood and stone. I think that was just a little too much for God to take. Let's talk, he says. And he sends a very unique messenger. All of a sudden, a hand starts scratching into the wall. I think it must have gone in like a six inches, you know, he's making a point. And it says, meeny, meeny, tickle, you farson. And the king is terrified, as you can imagine. But he has no idea what it means. So he asks everybody, what's this mean? And I will reward greatly the one who can d- interpret this for me. Does this sound familiar? He's taking a, a page out of his dad's playbook. And nobody can answer. And finally, the queen steps up and she says, um, in fact, it may be the queen mother. You know, you're the young punk and you think all your age are the ones that have it. Let me tell you, there's an old guy named Daniel. And he's able to tell the truth. And if you want to know the answers, you call him. And so Daniel gets called down. He gets taken out of mothballs and brought down. And Daniel talks to Belshazzar in a different tone than he talked to Nebuchadnezzar. He calls him out. He says, you watched your father. You saw his rise to arrogance, and you saw him for seven years out in the pasture with his hair growing long and his nails curling around, and you saw him humbled, and then you saw him come back with humility. And Daniel says, and yet you didn't learn. You had the most incredible living illustration, in, not, not for a day or two, for seven years. And yet you didn't learn, and now you have lifted yourself up against the God of heaven, and you've taken the articles that were used for worship, and you are now praising the gods of stone and gold. And he says, I can tell you what that handwriting on the wall means. And he didn't say, I wish this were for your enemies. (laughs) He says, this is what you deserve. You have been weighed, meeny, meeny, tikal, you farshan. It's actually two kinds of coins, mina, mina, a shekel. You've been weighed on the balance, and you've come up short. Tonight, your kingdom is going to be taken from you. You think you're invincible. You think it's your right. You think you're entitled. You think this is what you are about. Let me tell you, tomorrow morning, you're going to be a prisoner. You're about to understand that everything you had was a gift, and it's going to be taken away. Because God is able to bring those down who live in pride. What does that say for you and me? He says, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. It means that God is the one who makes the final judgment. That one of the truths of Scripture that we sometimes don't say as clearly as we should is that every single one of us will stand individually before the God of heaven. And no matter how quiet you've been or how loud, how rich or how poor, no matter what's been happening in your life, we will give account. In fact, the scripture refers in 
the book of Daniel again and again and again. So he is the most high God, that he is the only God, that he is the force, the power. And he's the one that we will stand before. And we will give an account of our life. And the crazy thing in our culture is that most people who are not following Jesus somehow hope that God's going to grade on a curve and that they are going to be good enough. Let me tell you, it's the most expensive bet you will ever make, and it has the least foundation. Because we can't say, God, at least I'm better than they were. God says, no, you are going to stand before me, the judge, and you're going to answer for yourself. And if we are going to try to stand in our goodness, I did these good things and these good things, then God will also say to us, meeny, meeny, tickle, you farson. That's what Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short. The same exact message to Belshazzar. He is the most high God and each of us will stand and give an account of our lives. And if you and I try to say, well, I deserve to be in heaven. I deserve to be with you because I've helped these people or I've done those things. It's interesting. I do a lot of funerals. It's interesting to me what people bring out as the sum total of the life of the person they love. And sometimes the best thing they can say is, well, he loved to hunt and fish. It's like, wow, that's the total sum of your life? He was a good neighbor. He helped people. Not that those things are wrong. But if you and I have any other answer to give, then the answer that comes from the gospel. You see, the gospel is great news if you understand the terrible news. The terrible news, if you and I stand before God and we try to give an account of our lives by our own arrogance, we're lost, we're doomed. But if you and I can say, because of your love, God, you sent your son, Jesus, and because he was a holy son of God and because he lived a perfect life, he was able to take the sins of the world. And when he died on the cross, he took Paul Glazner's sins And he paid my way so that my goodness is not my goodness, it's the goodness of Jesus. You see, it's so easy for us to start wedging over into arrogance, to think it's about my goodness or my effort or my purity, instead of it's all about Jesus. And the same power that's what you need to understand and bow humbly before to get saved is the same power we need every day to bow before and say, Jesus, I need you today. Because on my own, I'm dangerous. On my own, I'm arrogant. On my own, I'm entitled. On my own, I am focused on this life instead of the life that's real. And that you and I need a heavy dose of what God gave to Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar That instead of the temptation to say, look at me, we look at God and we say, look at you. You see, it's only when you accept the terrible news of my own wretchedness that the wonderful news of the gospel becomes great news. And you know, I totally believe that there are people who hear about Jesus and believe that he lived and are acknowledging God's presence, but they will not surrender because they want control. And that is the ultimate arrogance, to think that I can control my life better than the most high God. And I believe that it's pride that keeps people out of heaven more than probably any other sin. And God speaks to it clearly here in the book of Daniel. And so, Galatians says, don't be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows, whoever sows to... Please their flesh will from the flesh reap destruction. Whoever sows to plead the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. That we come to that profound humility (laughs) that there are two facts of human enlightenment. Number one, there is a God. And number two, it's not me. (laughs) That I acknowledge and bow before the King of Heaven. So when we come back to the message of the prophets, do you in humility say, God, I want to hear you. 
I need to read your word regularly. I need to be praying. I need, I need to be filled with wisdom and humility because that's not me. Do we say, God, I want to know you. I don't want to just know about you. I want to know you experientially and intimately in my life. And God, you deserve to be honored. And so I will not take your honor or your glory. I will give it to you. And when people want to praise or glorify me, I will deflect that because you are the one that deserves honor. I'm going to hand off to our green campus in South Umqua. And as the pastors there walk through those steps, God bless you. Love you guys. How does this apply to you? If I asked you, do you have a humble heart, most of us would have to say no. Are you seeking a humble heart? Do you want to be somebody with confidence, but somebody with gratitude, somebody that, that is willing to give glory to God, somebody who's willing to serve others, somebody who's living for the king instead of for themselves? And I see so much in my life that arrogance kills your sense of curiosity. It kills your ability to learn because you somehow think I've arrived. And let me tell you, the longer you're a Christian, the greater danger you're in of spiritual pride. Because you start thinking that the gospel is for somebody junior to you. And the reality is, is we need a fresh dose of humility so that we can learn, so that we can be corrected, so that we can be curious, so that we can be serving, so that we can be pouring out our life for what matters and what lasts. And so I ask you, do you have a, a humble heart? And I would challenge you further this week to pray twice as much as you usually do. That humility comes when I realize I need God desperately, not just when I'm in a crisis, but every day. And that you pray with gratitude. Don't be unmannerly and rude and run into God's presence with a gimme, gimme, gimme. Run in and say, wow, thank you for all that you've given to me already. And then come with humility and say, God, there's some things that we need to confess. I dare you use the word we when you're confessing sin of others and accept it. As we, your people, have walked away from you, we've gotten cold, we've gotten hard, we've allowed sin to come in, we've compromised. And then, as you begin to pray for others, that God would pour out His humility, His grace for them. And the lesson of Daniel is if you want to lift yourself up in pride, God can help you work on that. But if we humble ourselves, if we seek Him, it says He will let us find Him. He will draw close to us because God gives favor to the humble. And don't you want your name to be in that slot? God gives favor to me. That's what I want. Let's pray. Father, thank You for these lessons from thousands of years ago. And thank You, Lord, that we can diagnose the disease that is rampant today that's rampant in my own heart of entitlement and arrogance. And Father, I ask that you would give us a spirit of genuine, confident humility that we would be able to call sin out, but to call sinners in. That we would be serving you and serving others instead of trying to figure out how everybody can serve me. And that we would let you be the one in control. Thank you, God, for that very simple lesson that says, who's the boss? You're the boss. And God, we're so glad you are. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say, we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that, and we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.